today. God laid something on my heart a few weeks ago um, after I preached about unforgiveness. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to maybe flip that upside down and talk to you guys a little bit about faithfulness. Because I think we could all use a, a little bit of a message to hear something a little about faithfulness. So this week we're going to talk about faithfulness to the end. Faithfulness to the end. Um, speaking of faithfulness, do you know which animal is most unfaithful? <clears throat> the cat. <laughs> you know, that's a better answer than mine. I love cats. They taste great. Um, just kidding. Which animal is most unfaithful is a cheetah. <clears throat> all right. All right. So a true story. <laughs> what, did you just say you like the cat one better? That's so sad. I'm so defeated now. No, 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 no. This, this one's going to make it better, I promise. So there's this true story. There was this couple. They had been married for like 60 years. And she wasn't feeling well. She went to the doctor, got a really bad report. So they're in their last days. So they're, they're, they're spending all the time together that they can. And this had been a 60-year marriage of complete faithfulness. I mean, they were absolutely faithful to each other. They got along pretty well and everything. And so, but... The wife had one secret from the husband, that there was a box underneath their bed. Now, the husband knew about the box, but he was always, she asked him, please, honey, just never look inside of the box. So as, as they're in her last days, and he said to her, honey, is it okay if I look inside the box? And then she finally agreed. So he gets the box out from underneath the bed, and he opens it up. And there's $95,000 of cash and two hand-sewn dolls. And he's like, what in the world is this? And, and so she says, well, my grandmother, when I was a little girl, my grandmother told me, honey, when you grow up and you get married, okay, things are going to be challenging sometimes. And when you get really, really mad at your husband and like, like furiously mad and like you want to leave him maybe even... Just hand sew a doll, and that will make things better. And she's like, so I took that advice. And so the husband just bursts out in these joyful tears. And he's like, honey, 60 years we've been together, and you've only been upset at me two times like this? And he looks over at her, and she just has this kind of saddened look on her face. And, 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 and then he remembers the $95,000 cash, and he says, well, honey, what's wrong? And what is this $95,000 cash? And she said, well, that was the money I made from selling dolls. <laughs> All right. Let's take a test. Not really a test. We're going to give each of ourselves a grade. And this grade is going to be from one to a hundred. So if you had to give yourself a grade from one to a hundred, on your faithfulness to God and the depth of your relationship with him or how much you're growing closer to him, what would your grade be? I want you to think about it for a minute. One to a hundred. I want you to grade, obviously, 100 is good. One, not so much. Okay? What is your grade that you would give yourself on your faithfulness to God? How much you're growing in relationship with him, how much you're appreciating him, loving him, worshiping him, spending time with him. What's your grade? Don't say it out loud. Everybody got a number? Okay, I want you to hold that number. We're going to come back to that here in a little bit. Now, my goal today, I always want to tell you what I want to accomplish. My goal today is not to come down on you for a lack of faithfulness. It's actually quite the opposite. My goal today is to encourage you to realize that a close Faithful relationship with Jesus Christ is better than anything else. That close, intimate, faithful relationship that we have with Jesus Christ is better than anything you could ever imagine, better than anything that you could ever plan. And I want to encourage you in that today to hear this message from God's word 
and just say, you know what? Yes, I need to increase my faithfulness to God because that's better than anything. Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. I ran across this passage this week. This is so good. It says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. Now, if it stopped right there, that would be awesome. That would be enough. The, the writer here is speaking on behalf of God, and he says, because he loves me, I'll rescue him. And guess what? We all need to be rescued. And if you got nothing else, if you did not get this next breath that you're going to take, but you were rescued, that would be enough. But see, God is so good, he keeps going. He, he's, he, he is better than just that. He says, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What a great passage, isn't that? Just, just God is saying, hey, I'm going to be so faithful to you. And, and, and we can look back at our lives and just see how often God was faithful with us. He is always faithful. But God's telling us, if you stay faithful to me, things will be so good. Stay faithful to me. Now, we're living in some strange times, aren't we? Our world is, is evolving quite rapidly, right? We're living in a time where virtue and biblical values are often being vilified. We're living in a time when conviction is traded for convenience, where truth is being traded for tolerance, where accountability is traded for acceptance, where principles are being traded for party and politics, intelligence for ideology, faithfulness for a form of godliness, that's 2 Timothy 3, 5, and last but not least, maybe my favorite, we're living in a time where God Almighty is being traded for God, I'll let you know when I need you. Ouch. That's a scary thought, but that's the time that we are living in. And, and, and here's a big problem with that. Oftentimes, that's just church people. That's within the church. That's us. Because we have this, 2 Timothy 3, this form of godliness. We are trying to do this thing, but we are so pressured by the world and we fall prey to it. Um, it's easy to want the benefits of eternal life, but not the bothersome commands of the Bible. That's a big one, huh? It's easy to want the benefits of eternal life, but not the bothersome commands of the Bible. Now, please understand, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. I do not think that the commands of the Bible are bothersome. I think Pastor Ed Newton says it best. He says, the Bible is not a book full of cruel commandments. The Bible is a book filled with sweet solutions. So true. So true. One pastor says this, God has a major problem with part-time Christians who don't want to be full-time saints. God has a major problem with those people. Just this part-time dabbling in our Christian faith, but we don't want to be full-time saints. So here's a question. What causes someone to go from a growing relationship with Jesus to a complacent, non-fruit-producing, truth-compromising, apathetic, or lukewarm Christian life? What causes that? What causes someone to go from this relationship and, and, and they're growing in the Lord and then all of a sudden it just kind of falls away and then a few years happens and they look back and their relationship is nothing but a little bit of knowledge in their head. What happens? What happens there? Jesus has a lot to say about this. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. Now that sounds pretty bad, right? I'm pretty sure none of us want to be against Jesus. 
So he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather, there's that thing again, with me scatters. So I think Jesus is making it important that this with me thing is something that we have to have. So what does that mean, with me? Well, I think it means following me. Whoever is not following me, whoever is not obeying me, whoever is not keeping in relationship with me, or whoever is not staying committed to me is against me. I've heard it said, I don't think there's any middle ground. I think you're either growing in your relationship with Jesus or you're falling away from Jesus. I don't really believe in lukewarm Christianity. I don't think that's a thing. We're, we're either getting closer to Jesus or getting farther away from him. Nothing in between. Here's another verse, John 14, 12. The first half of the verse says, Very truly I tell you, Jesus says, whoever believes in me. Now, what does that mean, believes in me? I think it's the same as that with me thing. Or whoever has faith in me will do the works I have been doing. We'll follow him, we'll, we'll obey him, obey his commands, have relationship with him. So our question again is, what causes someone to go from a growing relationship with Jesus to a complacent, non-fruit-producing, truth-compromising, apathetic, or lukewarm Christian life? I think it is a lack of faithfulness. Simply a lack of being faithful to God. Now, I, 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 we all know what faith is. It's one of those churchy words, and we kind of know what faithfulness is, so I always like to give a definition. So I, I Googled, I went on dictionary.com, and I, look up, I looked up faithfulness, and it simply said, faithfulness is the quality of being faithful. <laughs> and I'm like, well, dictionary.com, that wasn't uber helpful because I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to use the root word in your definition, but nonetheless, dictionary.com knows a little bit more about dictionary in than I do, so it is what it is, the quality of being faithful. Dr. Tony Evans says this. I, I love Tony Evans. He's a pastor. If you guys know Priscilla Shirer, that's Priscilla Shirer's father. He is a, a great, great, great preacher. He says, faithfulness is dependability regardless of circumstances. That's good. Now, that's not really a definition, but that does describe what faithfulness is. It's dependability. That's that no matter what, I am going to be there for you, with you, no matter what, regardless of circumstances. I think that's what our faithfulness to our Creator and our Father ought to be. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. And if you don't own one, you are welcome to take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you. You can mark in that Bible if you would like. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation, when we hear that, we often think of end times and eschatology and, and all of these crazy things that are going to happen. And that's, that, that is most of what Revelation is. But in the first few chapters, John has this revelation from Jesus and Jesus tells him to write to seven different churches now these are these were seven actual churches that were in their day in that area that John would have been familiar with and so one of the churches in fact I think this is the one church where Jesus doesn't really come down on them he actually kind of lifts them up and edifies them is the church in Smyrna so Revelation chapter 2, he starts in verse 8. He says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last. Now, I have to pause there. This doesn't really have to do anything with the faithfulness sermon. But when I see this as a pastor, I have to just park on this for a second. We have a little bit of a thing here. We have, I just said, Jesus appeared to John to give him a revelation, but we said, these are the words of him who is the first and the last. John is kind of pulling back from the Old Testament. Here's three specific places, Isaiah 41.4, Isaiah 44.6, and Isaiah 48.12. 
where God is called the first and the last. And in fact, in Isaiah 44, 6, it says, This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. Now, now pause there for a second. As we see often, here is one time where it was like, okay, just in case you didn't get who we're talking about, I'm going to say it three times. So I said, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. So nobody has any question who is speaking here. Isaiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord Almighty. Then he says, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Now, God's making it pretty clear, right? Because there are very, very well-known denominations and beliefs, and if you want to call it a faith, then you can call it a cult, or you can call it whatever. Very, very well-known beliefs out there that you can be your own God one day, or there are many gods, polytheism. And God Almighty is saying, no, no, no. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no other. So this is God Almighty calling himself the first and the last. Now, back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. It says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Now, wait a minute. That's kind of strange because did God die? Who died and came to life again? Jesus. So, wait a minute. We have something that we have to maybe dig into. This is Jesus calling himself God Almighty. Calling himself as part of, we know as the Trinity, although the Bible doesn't mention that word Trinity. The triune, the three in one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Jesus is not God or did not claim to be God. Again, very popular in religion. You know why? Because the second that you take one ounce of authority away from Jesus, that's a false Christ. That is not a saving Jesus. My Jesus, the Jesus that I read about in his word, is God. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. By the way, if anybody ever tries to tell you that Jesus wasn't God or didn't claim to be God, ask them why Jesus got hung on the cross. For blasphemy, because he claimed to be God. Are we clear on that? Sorry, I have to just pause there and go there. So, verse 9. Jesus says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Now, there's a lot going on. There's a lot here that we have to historically understand. So this city, Smyrna, this was a Roman colony in modern-day Turkey and around in that area. And um, it was surrounded by these mountains. And it's said that these mountains that surround this city look like a crown. And it was also said, many scholars believe, that the buildings at that time were made to also reflect a crown. Now, why is that important? Why is that significant? Because they worshipped Caesar. Caesar was God. And Caesar, was that was the law that you worship Caesar, that he is God. Now, why was this a problem? We think this would have been a problem for Christians? Yeah. Isaiah 46, it says, apart from me, there is no God. So here we have Christians in this city and all throughout the Roman Empire that it was the law that you had to worship Caesar as God. And Christians are trying to stand firm in their faith and stay faithful to their Savior. And they're being persecuted. While we recognize government, we respect government, we don't bow to government. And not recognizing Caesar as Lord made you an enemy of the state. And it subjected you to jail, uh, property confiscation, and a mess 
of other legal problems. I mean, you, you were not just a second-class citizen. Like I said, you were an enemy of the state if you did not recognize Caesar as Lord. So this made a problem for our Christians here in Smyrna. So verse 9 again, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Jesus is saying, I know that the authorities have just taken away your stuff. They've persecuted you. They've taken your property. But because of your faith, because of your perseverance, because of your unwillingness to compromise, you are rich. You are very, very rich. That's what Jesus is telling this church. Imagine that. Imagine these people that are going through this that literally have had their lives stripped out from under them. Possibly beaten, sometimes murdered, treated horribly. And Jesus is saying, I know what you're going through. I get it. I see it. But I'm telling you, you're rich. Stay faithful. The allegiance of our hearts must not be to anything else. Our allegiance must be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords above everything else. Everything else. No matter what the government says, no matter what your friends say, nothing else. Our allegiance must be to Jesus Christ. So I want to give you a couple of encouragements today. Again, I don't want this to be like this Debbie Downer message where I'm coming at you and saying, you all aren't faithful and neither am I and we're bad people. That's not what I'm saying. I want to encourage every single one of us, myself included, to say, hey, let's take a look at how faithful we are to God and let's see as a church, as a body of Christ, how we can be more faithful to him. So my encouragement number one is stay faithful to Jesus through opposition from the world. Stay faithful to Jesus through opposition from the world. The world's going to throw a lot of opposition at us. This, this was actually their government then, but man, there is opposition going to be all around. May not be as severe as they had it. Maybe not here in our country, but there are Christians around the world right now that are going through that. How do we see it? Well, you might get overlooked for a promotion at work because you're one of those Christians. Although as Christians, we should be in the right way professing our faith and we should be people that employers want to hire. Like our standards should be way higher. We should get to work early. We should stay late. Not every time, not in an unhealthy way. We should give our 110 all of the time. We should be honorable not take shortcuts. Our employers should be looking at us going, I, I don't know about the whole Jesus stuff, but man, I want them on my team. Like, like that's who, I want to hire people like that. But sometimes you're going to see opposition from maybe like missing a per position or an opportunity at work. Maybe you might lose some popularity with friends because you're one of those Jesus freaks. Let you know a little secret, those aren't great friends anyway, if they have a problem with you and your faith. Um, you might miss out on some great opportunities to go fishing or golfing or sleeping in or whatever else we sometimes want to do on a Sunday morning. Just want to throw that out there. Now, please understand, Sunday morning coming to service should be a very, very small part of your relationship with God. A very small part. If you, if you look at your Sunday morning attendance and, and you're like, my faith life is great because I have made it two weeks in a row. Uh, not so much. But it's a very, very, very small part. But it's a very important part. I happen to think it's a very important part. Now parents, I'm going to talk at you for a second. Again, kind of off-road here, but I've, I've, I've just got to go there. I, I did a lot of years in student ministry, a lot of years. And often I would go to church and I would see parents, but I didn't see the kids. And I would say, hey, where's so-and-so today? 
And the answer I would often get was, oh, I just couldn't get them out of bed today. Or they just didn't want to come today. Or they had something to do today or something like that. Parents, as grace and mercy filled as I possibly can, I just want to just speak this over you. You are in charge. Okay? You get to say, Sunday mornings, we go to church. We honor God with our lives. And guess what? Parents, they need to see that from you. They need to see a consistent faith walk from you. Because you know that whole do as I say, don't do as I do thing? It doesn't work. Now maybe you're like, a little too far, Trev. A little too far. I'll give you a passage. Once I go there, you're going to know, okay, I know where you're going. Joshua. He's getting ready to take the children of Israel into the promised land. They've escaped Egypt. They've wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses just died. And Joshua gets up and he's getting ready to make his big speech. And he says, choose this day who you will serve. Whether it's the God that your ancestors served in Egypt or the God of this land. But choose this day who you will serve. And then he says that line that we all know no, no in love, but as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. What do you think Joshua said to his kids when they woke up and they said, I don't really feel like going to church today? How do you think that went? Not too good. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Parents, I just want to, in, in love, speak that over you. You are in charge. It is your job. It's not my job. It wasn't my job as a youth pastor to speak that into your kids. Full time, that's your job. I want to challenge you with that. So you're going to face opposition from the world. Now, by the way, this is no surprise to God. He's not up in heaven going, Oh my goodness, they're picking on my people. What, what am I to do? That's not what God's doing. In fact, here's three passages that remind us of this. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul, it says he was given this thorn in his flesh. And Paul was like, please God, take this away, take this away, take this away. He prayed for it three times. And I don't think he just prayed three times. I think three seasons of life he prayed for it. And God said, no, 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 no. My grace is sufficient for you. I want to leave this in your life to keep you humble and to keep you dependent on me. So God's not surprised that things are happening in our lives. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians 1, 4 through 7. It says God allows affliction in our lives and then he comforts us. He, what, what, wait a minute, I passed over it so quickly. He allows affliction in our lives. He allows bad stuff to happen. Uh-huh. But then what does he do? He comforts us, and not just because he loves us, but he comforts us so that we can know that comfort, and then we can go comfort others who are going through things, whose faith maybe is kind of falling short. And we can say, God, I, I wanna, I, I'm so faithful to you, God, because thank you. You're comforting me in this, God. You, you did not leave me, God. You've got my back in this. God, I want to stay faithful to you. Let me be an encouragement to someone who is hurting. And then one more, James 1 through 3, it says, the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance or patience, as some versions say. The testing of your faith. It says God allows affliction or testing in our lives to grow us and produce perseverance and patience. So God allows these things in our lives so that we can grow, so that we can stay humble, so that we can keep our eyes focused on him, and so that we can encourage and comfort others when we need to. Now, we may not like that God allows so much affliction and persecution in our lives, but that's where we have to remain faithful to him. That's where we've just kind of got to stick it out to where like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. 
God, I know you're good, but that we just got to remember. We've talked a lot recently about remembering what God has done in the past to know what he can do in the future. But sometimes this opposition that we face, again, we, we, we look at this church in Smyrna, and I mean, that was real opposition. Sometimes the opposition that we face is best described as, or disguised as distraction or complacency. That's, to us oftentimes, the stronger opposition that gets us a lot. I got to be honest, just to be a little bit transparent, this is what got me for several years of my life. I, I grew up in this church in school. I was very, very faithful. Uh, a, a, as much as a, as a kid could have, I had a great relationship with the Lord. I mean, I did a wanna and all of that stuff. I mean, I knew the Bible verses. And then I became a teenager, those pesky teenagers, right? And, and, and as I kind of got a little bit older, I, I just kind of, I, I didn't lose my faith in God. I did it like just denounce, my, just nothing like that. I just kind of got complacent. I got a little kind of apathetic in my faith. And this went on for years. And then I got involved in a church. I, I started serving. I started doing some ministry. And things started to happen. And I could feel God working in my life. And then one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was out on a run, and I, I don't even like to run. I don't know why I was running, okay? But I was out on a run, and God just broke me. And he said, okay, are you ready to come back to me now? I was, I was serving. Like, I was attending church every Sunday. Like, I was, I was in ministry. I was doing things. And God finally said, okay, now are you ready to give your heart back to me? So this complacency and distraction oftentimes that's what's going to get us and take our faithfulness away from God and put it on ourselves it goes on in Revelation chapter 2 it says I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan so now we move into a different category yes Sometimes opposition can even come from within the church walls. He is really hitting them hard now. So not only do we need to stay faithful to Jesus through opposition from the world, that's my encouragement number one, my encouragement number two to you is, we need to stay faithful to Jesus through opposition from the hypocrites. I didn't call them church people, I didn't call them whatever, I just called them hypocrites. We have to stay faithful against the opposition, through that opposition from the hypocrites. Now listen, I am so thankful. Let me just tell you, I am so thankful to be a part of a church like ICC that has very, very little drama. I, I, I got to tell you, there is so little drama here. And, and when we do, we have discussions and we talk about it and just, psh, it's no big deal. I am so thankful and so grateful that I am a part of a church that is just, we're not perfect. I am very not perfect, okay? I make a lot of mistakes and have a lot of room to grow. But for the most part, we are a drama-free church who loves Jesus and wants to serve. Amen? Good job, guys. So... Verse 10, this is our last verse, it says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, wait, there's, there's going to be more and, and more opposition, and, and sometimes there's just more and more. Now, this applies directly to them and the 10 days thing, don't have time to get into all of that. But yes, sometimes it is going to get worse. Guess what? We need to remain faithful. Here's the last half of the verse. Here's our point right here. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Jesus is saying, listen, all of this opposition that's going to come at you, like I know they're taking your property, they're taking your stuff, you're, you're poor just, just 
economically, but spiritually you are rich. I know that you're being ridiculed and, and you have opposition from within the church walls, people that are calling themselves Jews and they're not even, they're from the synagogue of Satan. I know that there's all this stuff going on and opposition from your friends and there's complacency and, and all of this junk that's always at you, but stay faithful to the end and you will receive the victor's crown. You'll receive life. That's going to be your victor's crown. Now, what, what was this victor's crown thing? Remember when you, when you see kind of drawings or, or movies to where, you know, back then, back in the Roman times, they had, you know, like their version of the Olympics or something, and you'd have somebody that, that won this tournament or something, and they had this wreath on their head. That's what that's talking about. That's the victor's crown. That was you won. You received victory. So Jesus is taking us back to this analogy from Smyrna. Remember what was around the city of Smyrna? Mountains that look like a crown. Buildings that were shaped like a crown. Just to honor Caesar. And God's going, Jesus says, I'll give you a crown, but my crown's going to be life. The victor's crown. That's what I want to give you. Jesus says, persevere through the end, and I'll make up for everything you ever lost. Now, I want you to think about that grade that you gave yourself in the very beginning. Whatever that number was, was it accurate? Does it need to be adjusted maybe a little bit? Maybe after you've heard this message, uh, okay, maybe I was counting on the church attendance thing a little bit more. Maybe I'm not quite as faithful as I thought I was. I want everybody to think about your number. Maybe you need to adjust that number. Is it where it ought to be? And if you had to stand before God Almighty right now and tell him your number of what you think it is, would you be proud of that number? Would you be proud to say, God, I've got a 47? Probably not. I'm going to encourage you. Stay faithful to the Lord. Keep your eyes focused on him. Tune out the distractions and the persecution the world can bring. Just keep your eyes on him. Stay faithful to the end. That verse 10 again, it says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I just want to read these verses from Psalm 91 over you again. I just want you to listen to these verses. Realize what God is saying to us. He says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Jesus, we come before you today grateful and thankful that you are so faithful to us that you promise us that you will never leave us you will never forsake us you'll never turn your back on us that you will always be faithful thank you God that we have in you towards us the perfect picture of faithfulness God, I don't want this message today to land on hearts as an accusation or condemning people. I want it to be an encouragement. 
that you have so much to offer us, that your grace and that your mercy is so big, so wide and so strong, God, that we have every reason to want to be faithful to you. God, open our eyes and help us to see it. God, take the scales off of our eyes of the filter of the world. God, help us just to set our eyes and our focus on you. God, help us to stay faithful to you to the end. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I know that there's some here this morning who do not know Jesus as your personal Savior. You've never started an actual relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've counted on church attendance or your grandma's faith or your good works or whatever it is. Right now in this moment, would you realize that you need a relationship with Jesus? That you would trust in, in Jesus and Jesus alone. That he died on the cross to take your sin. And not only did he die, but he rose again three days later to prove that he had authority over death, over hell, over sin, and over the grave. If that's you this morning, and you would like to start that relationship with Jesus, would you just say, Jesus, save me, change me. I trust in you, and I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make any fuss, but would you just slip your hand up? Say, I said that today for the first time. I got this right today. Thank you. Today, I decided to give my life to Jesus. Father, we're just so grateful and thankful again that you are the picture of faithfulness that we can always count on you no matter what. Thank you that you are a God worth following, that you are God and there is no other. God, we pray for this time of offering now. Use it in an awesome way to further your kingdom, God. Help us to be generous and help us to be wise. We love you, Jesus, and it is in your awesome, most holy name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.